Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, well, whatever time you're watching this. So my name's David White. I'm one of the supporter development officers in the Garden Bird Watch team at BTO. And also, we also have Steve Willis, the BTO Scotland engagement officer, who's going to be delivering the second half of this talk. I will be doing the first part. So it's about 25 years of BTO Garden Bird Watch. So without any further ado, I will begin. So BTO Garden Bird Watch has been running for over 25 years. It started on the 1st of January 1995. Almost 20,000 people take part in the survey. And during 2020, we received a total of 330,163 submissions, which is a remarkable number. So the aim of the survey is to submit weekly maximum counts of all birds and a selection of other wildlife species from your garden. I'll talk a bit more about the methodology in a minute. We also collect data on landscape context, garden size and characteristics such as ponds, bushes, shrubs, that kind of thing. OK, so I thought I'd pull out a bit of local data. So we tried to put in a bit of local data for you, or at least Scottish data, I should say. So I'm based at BTO HQ down in Fetford in Norfolk, and Steve's actually based at the BTO office in Stirling, just to tell you where we're all based. So this shows and where people take part in Garden Birdwatch in Scotland, and the larger the blob, the more participants there are in that area. So just to point out a few areas that are local to you and uh, hopefully possibly where you live. So we have Edinburgh here, the Scottish borders there, have Stirling down there and Argyll and Butte. So it actually looks like Highland is the largest blob just, but it is a big area. So quite a few garden bird watchers in, in, that, in that area of Scotland. So it just shows you where, where all of the participants are based, where they live. Okay, so here are some interesting statistics about garden bird watch. So I'm gonna, not gonna read all of these out, but just point out a few for you. So gardens from which we have received over a thousand weekly lists during the last 25 years, 1,185. So this shows the dedication of participants in Garden Bird Watch. So over, so over a thousand people have submitted over, uh, over a thousand weekly lists of their garden wildlife over the last 25 years. And to add to that, the most weekly submissions from one garden, 1,300. So at the time that that statistic was 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 drawn out that participant there had only been 1304 weeks within the last 25 years so that person had only missed four weeks of garden bird watch recording in the last 25 years that is dedication that is really impressive and of course if you're watching your garden that frequently over the last 25 years inevitably you're going to see some really interesting changes so if you take part in Garden Bird Watch, it can be very, very addictive and possibly you may get up to over a thousand lists in a few years time. So really remarkable. So total number of individual birds and other wild animals counted 194 million, which is a big number. So species with the most individual records, the house sparrow with 18, four, 18 million recorded. Species found in most gardens, the blackbird on 8 million lists. So those two species may not be too much of a surprise for you, but it just shows what species people are most likely to see in their gardens. And then at the bottom, just to point this out quickly, incidents of sick, injured or dead wildlife recorded, 160,597. So the significance of this is that there is now a partnership. So there's now a partnership between Garden Bird Watch and the Garden Wildlife Health Project, which in itself is a partnership project between RSPB, BTO, Frog Life and Zoological Society for London, which monitors garden wildlife health across Britain. So if people take part in Garden Bird Watch online and they see sick, injured or dead birds in their garden or other wildlife, they can report that and it goes directly into the Garden Wildlife Health database and it helps us to monitor where certain diseases may be prevalent at the time. So I'll go on to talk about garden wildlife disease, disease shortly, especially around green finches, but it's just a very, very important link up between the, between the survey and that project. 
So talking about methodology, I've already touched in essence, the aim of the survey is to submit the highest count of each species that you see at one time in your garden over the course of a week. So if, for example, you saw these six long-tailed tits on your feeders, and that's the highest count you saw at one time during the week, that would be your garden bird watch return for that species that particular week. So in a way, the methodology is very similar to the RSPB's Big Garden Word Bird Watch, which I'm sure many of you have taken part in and heard of. That's actually been running since 1979. So the key difference, though, between the two surveys is that whereas the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch takes place during the last weekend of January each year, people spend an hour counting the highest number of each species that they see on their in their feed on their in their gardens at one time. BTO Garden Bird Watch, people can actually take part in weekly throughout the year. So they submit their counts weekly rather than annually. And over the course of the year, that weekly data is really fascinating. And we'll go into some of the species that are recorded and how their how their recording rates change over the course of time, how their count data changes over the course of a year. But in essence, that's how people take part in Garden Bird Watch. So here we have the 25 year rankings of, of the BTO Garden Bird Watch. So these were, these were published last April. So the top 20 bird species and the, the, the rankings on the left. And then on the right, you've got how the rankings have changed over the last 25 years. Species numbers that are shaded in green are species that have increased. Species that have declined in ranking are shaded in red. So, for example, wood pigeon, goldfinch, nuthatch have increased, whereas unfortunately species like house sparrow, starling and greenfinch have declined. So what I'm actually going to talk about now is specifically about greenfinch decline in gardens. So here we have a lovely male greenfinch. So sadly, the British greenfinch population has been really badly hit by a disease called trichomonosis which has been prevalent in amongst finches for the last 15 years or so. It was first seen in around 20, 2005 or 2006. So trichomonosis also affects pigeons, but the, the strain that affects green finches actually and other species of finches is actually a different strain. And it has really affected the population very negatively. And it has meant that green finches have actually declined by up to two thirds in gardens over the last 10 years or so, which is a real worry. So the disease trichomonosis, unfortunately, is transmitted directly at bird feeders because it's transmitted by the bird saliva when they get onto bird feeders and bird tables. And because greenfinches are such sociable birds, it can be transmitted quite quickly. And, it, and unfortunately, it is deadly. I will show you an image of a, an affected bird in a minute. But in order to try and prevent diseases such as trichomonosis from spreading in your garden, there are a few simple things you can do. So cleaning your feeders regularly. So cleaning them with hot water, soapy water, possibly a weak bleach solution. Rotating your feeders regularly so they're not always in the same place only putting as much feed seed in the feeders that you think the birds are going to eat so there's no wastage and and that seems to be quite a good effective way of trying to pre prevent these diseases because what you don't want to see is a effective with trichomonosis like this and it's not very nice to see we know but this is what a bird with trike looks like very very fluffed up lethargic and has difficulty swallowing so as you can see it almost looks like it's dribbling here and it unfortunately is fatal so there's when a bird is like this there isn't too much that can be done which is a real worry so and if you do keep seeing birds with that look affected by trichomonosis in your garden the most effective way of preventing it from spreading further is actually to stop feeding the birds for a couple of weeks take your feeders down and hopefully that should help to solve the problem so and what it's caused is a decline in green finch numbers in gardens. So the thinner grey lines are historic data. So this is count data for the last 10 years or so. 
So the blue line is 2019 data, the red line is 2020. So the last two years, as you can see, it's count data is going down and down each year and it's a real worry. And trichomonosis seems to be the main driver behind that. So it is a real concern. So, as I said, it does affect pigeon species as well. Uh, so it does affect, occasionally affect collared doves as well. So collared dove is a species that is doing relatively well in Britain, quite a common garden bird, but we have noticed a moderate decline in numbers in recent years. And trichomonosis seems to be one of the contributing factors to that decline. So looking at similar data for collared dove, again, you have the historic data above the gray lines and then blue and red lines, blue 2019, red 2020. So again, the average count data is dropping. So it may not all, all be to do with trichomonosis. They're, they also may be outcompeted by wood pigeons. There's a possibility that predation may affect their numbers to a certain extent. We don't know, but it seems that trichomonosis is definitely one of the driving factors behind collared dove their decline. So unfortunately, we know that it does also affect chaffinches. So I'm not going to talk too much about chaffinch decline because Steve's going to talk about that in his half of the talk. But we do know that the chaffinches can be affected by trichomonosis, as can goldfinches, unfortunately. But unfortunately, with chaffinches, they do also get affected by this disease here. It's a bit of a mouthful, but this is fringilla papillomavirus. So it's basically clubfoot or bumblefoot in chaffinches. So birds have these unsightly growths on their feet. Unfortunately, it does impair their movement. So of course, it means they're at higher risk of being predated. And <clears throat> again, if you see birds like this affected in your garden, the best way of trying to prevent it from spreading is to stop feeding the birds for a couple of weeks, because again, it's very sad that there's one disease that's affecting chaffinches, never mind two. So whatever you can do is very, very beneficial. So another disease just to look out for quickly is avian pox. It's slightly different to trichomonosis insofar as avian pox doesn't tend to be fatal. But what it does show is these groves on the bird. So it mainly affects great tits and dunnocks. And as you can see, this great it's got an unfortunate large tumor like growth above it uh, its eye which which would likely to affect affect its vision so again it'd be more at risk from predation so it does get transmitted in a slightly different way than trichomonosis but if you do see birds affected like this it's best just to stop feeding the birds in your garden again because you don't want this spreading and affecting the birds because it's really not very nice to see OK, so I'm going to finish my talk by talking a bit more slightly happier things because I've been talking about disease and doom and gloom. We don't want to hear anything more about that. So what I'm going to do is talk about some butterfly data. So for those of you who record butterflies regularly and submit your data to butterfly conservation, it's worth noting that the uh, BTO Garden Birdwatch data is regularly shared with with butterfly conservation as well. So we do our bit to share our data with organizations like Butterfly Conservation and Bumble, the Bumblebee Trust and other organizations. So here we have a lovely peacock butterfly, which is a regular, uh, a recent colonizer to Scotland, gets its name from its peacock eyes on its wings. So I'm gonna show you a few graphs about a couple of species. So first we have the peacock recording rate from 2018 and 2019 respectively. So if you're able to cast your mind back to 2018, it was a very, very cold spring when we had the beast from the east, when there was lots of ice and snow. And then 2019 was a bit of a more typical spring and then quite a warm summer. So as you can see, peacock butterfly, the light blue line in 2018, took a long time for them to get going in gardens because of the cold weather. In, whereas in 2019, relative, a bit more normal, so the recording rate was higher. And actually in the summer in 2019, the recording rate was higher again, possibly because after the, for, after the beast from the East in 2018, sorry, the recording rate struggled to increase and numbers struggled to increase. Whereas in the summer of 2019, it was very, very warm. So there were a lot more <clears throat> peacock butterflies visiting gardens 
very, very weather affected bus flies, of course, as, you, as you, many of you will know. But this is simply from people submitting their butterfly data weekly, the kind of thing we can find out. So another species I'm going to show a graph about is the comma butterfly, which is a species that's increasing its range further north each year. So you may be seeing these butterflies around you in a, in a month or so time when they start emerging. So they tend to emerge from around late, late March, early April onwards. It does depend on the weather. But in a way, this is a similar graph to what I've already shown with comparison between 2018 and 2019 data in Scotland. So 2018, again, after the beast from the east, a slow start in the recording rate, whereas in 2019, they were actually starting to emerge quite early from February and March onwards. So um, emerging a lot earlier, so in higher numbers as well. And then what's also interesting about this graph here is that the, in, the, in, the, in September 2018, the recording rate actually dropped quite considerably, whereas in 2019, it really it went up again. So really increased, possibly due to the, the mild weather and the fact that it was quite warm. But again, through people submitting their weekly butterfly data, this is the kind of interesting things that we find. So the last species I'm going to talk to you about is painted lady butterfly which is a migrant. So just in case you don't know, painted ladies are migrant species that come from Africa and the Middle East. And each year we get a different number visiting Britain. So, but what happens every 10 years or so, there's, there's a big painted lady year or an influx of painted ladies. So there's a big influx in 2009 and then another big one in 2019. And I'm gonna show you some data about that in a minute. So, what we were finding in 2019, which is this big, is the blue line in the graph here, a big, big increase in count data, especially in July and August, that because there were so many painted ladies around, this translated in higher counts in gardens. So I hasten to add, this is UK data. This, this isn't just, this isn't just Scotland data, but it just shows how many more were being seen in gardens. And actually at BTO HQ at the time, I remember, taking a phone call from a very excited lady who lived in Dundee, who was seeing painted ladies in her garden for the first time ever, which was really, must've been really exciting. Lovely to see them getting so far north and that's a big influx. And then an interesting comparison to the red line at the bottom, which is actually the 2020 data, a more typical painted lady year, when actually there were very few painted ladies visiting gardens. So, Going back to normal, if you, if you will, with the numbers, so perhaps in 2029, there'll be another big painted lady year. We'll see, who knows? But again, very interesting data. We also record, we take data from mammals, dragonflies and other invertebrates. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to tell you anything more about them today, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pass you over to Steve for his part of the talk. All right, thank you, David. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the sort of outputs that you can see and things that are available on the BTO website for you to, for anyone to have a look at. Um, if you want to find out more about getting involved or you want to uh, sign up to any of our BTO surveys, then you can just go to bto.org forward slash my BTO. And there you can either log back into something you've already registered for or sign up as a volunteer. All of the surveys are free uh, and we appreciate um, get anybody getting involved in any capacity. So this is um, the sort of things you can see behind the scenes. When you log into my BTO, and this is for my own garden, this is the data for my own garden. You can see all sorts of different data about the things that you've recorded, uh, however long you've been involved uh, in, this, in the scheme. And so from here, you can see these different bird uh, families with the different species that have turned up in the garden. It's always quite exciting when you get to add a new species or a new family to your to your data. And there's you can see an arrow there that won't work if I click on it there, but it shows you other information about the mammals you record, invertebrates and things like that as well. So there's loads and loads of good information that as a as a recorder, you can look at your own information. But there's also a great deal of information you can see that anybody can look at simply by going onto the BTO website. And if you go to projects and then search for Garden Birdwatch, then you can go to this section, explore our data, 
where you can see uh, lots and lots of information. You can actually narrow it down to regions or countries. Uh, you can compare species, compare countries or regions as well. You can get lots of useful stuff out of it. We're going to look at annual patterns of garden use and long-term patterns of garden use, but David's already showing you some maps, showing you the GBW participant stuff. This is all free for you to have a look at just on the website, even if you're not involved as a volunteer. So one thing that you can see is you obviously see seasonal trends for species. So whether they're summer visitors or winter visitors, in this case here, we've got a spotted flycatcher uh, and apologies to the enthusiastic entomologists who won't appreciate the, the damsel flies that have met a sticky end there, but these things happen. And what we see when we look at the blue line here, the blue line is the data for Scotland for last year. And so no records through winter, then come April and into May, we get this peak with birds being reported in over 1% of gardens, drops off a little bit, then there's a bump up in August when we start to see probably fledglings and migrants beginning to pass through gardens uh, on passage. And then of course it drops away back as uh, to nothing in winter, as is typical for summer migrants because those birds have left. Compare and contrast that with a classic winter visitor, in this case, the field fair. With a field fair, we get an influx of them from around October, November time. And they come in, they gorge themselves on rowan and cotonia aster and holly, really popular garden uh, plants that will come in and gorge themselves on the berries. And then they begin to drift off by midwinter. They're, they're probably still in the country, but they're not visiting gardens as frequently. By summer, there are hardly any, if any at all, in the country. So next to none being recorded. So what that means is that we see uh, these peaks and troughs when we look at the data longer term. This is the data for tree sparrow. And as I say, the sort of sawtooth effect is caused by those seasonal fluctuations, either uh, spring peaks or autumn peaks for these birds. And so in this case, the blue line here is the British uh, data overall, so overall for the UK. But what we see with the black line is the data for Scotland. We see a massive increase in re recording rate for tree sparrow in Scotland, where it's relatively stable for the whole of the UK, we're seeing a significant increase in Scotland, which is really, really interesting. And it's nice when you go onto the website that you can compare years, you can compare species, you can compare regions. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting to do that. Because what it does reveal is there's winners and losers in all these things. As David has uh, discussed, lots of things have changed their ranking and how common or otherwise they are in gardens. The blue line here is nuthatch across the whole of the UK where there's a, there's a gradual upwards increase in numbers, but it's startling in Scotland that to the mid 1990s, there are no nuthatch being recorded in gardens or not through this scheme anyway. And then it's very, very, very small numbers. And by the mid 2000s, numbers are really starting to increase. And then by nowadays, we're getting up to 10, 12% of gardens are recording nuthatch. And that, that's a species that's marching north all the time. Um, and is now beginning to show up even up in the highlands uh, and the northwest. So pretty interesting that uh, we're, we can record this. And this is all individual people contributing small amounts of data, but cumulatively it shows really interesting stuff. And as David was saying about, um, we're going to touch on chaffinch and how they're faring. When we look at the overall UK population, they're definitely declining. And that's quite an alarming situation. They're declining less quickly in Scotland, but they are declining. And the worry that we have about this is that we began to see this sort of trend with greenfinch back in the mid 2000s. And the worry is, is that chaffinch are going the same direction. Uh, we are doing some research into that with some partners uh, and we, we need to work out what's going on because chaffinch are a, an amazing bird. They're a brilliant bird. They're really, really nice to see a very popular bird and it'd be a real shame to see them go. So definitely a requirement for more research into species like this. So why not get involved? Garden Bird Watch is a, is a brilliant survey. It's really nice and straightforward. Anyone can get involved. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need great optics. Um, it's quite a straightforward one uh, for you to take part in. It adds very, very important data about a massive UK habitat. Think about the cumulative area of gardens across the UK. It's a vast area um, and does represent a significant habitat in the UK. So let's record it. Let's find out what's going on there very family friendly. You can get the kids involved, you can get your granny involved. Um, it's a really good way to, to engage people with nature. And remember, it's much more than just birds as well. There's lots of other stuff you can record. And it is good fun, trust me, and it is borderline addictive. Uh, you get very, very excited, um, as I did last week when Redpole turned up in the garden for the first time. We've lived here four years and uh, that seems like a big tick when you can enter that into the data and uh, you've got another species added to your list. 
So uh, why not? Oh, I think I'll hand over to David for this, just for this last section. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so if you want to sign up to GBW, it's free. So you can sign up online here. So bto.org slash GBW. So if you sign up, you can take part in the survey up to weekly. And you also receive a weekly Garden Bird Watch newsletter that's written by the garden ecology team, shares results. There's also a chance for you to share your own garden sightings and photographs in that. So if you don't want to record online, you can also record using the paper forms. Out of 20,000 people who take part in GBW, we still have 2,000 people submitting their data using paper forms, which is absolutely fine. If you want to find out some more about Garden Bird Watch, give BTO a ring or our email address is gbw at bto.org. So thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions, we'd, uh, we'd be happy to answer them in the time we have. So thank you very much.